John chapter 9, this is chapter I'll be focusing on in the sermon this morning. John chapter 9, uh, we'll read verses 1 to 41. Hear the word of God. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back, seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. By, by, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. 
They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. When some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. As far as the reading of Holy Scripture, we'll prepare our hearts for the proclamation of this gospel by singing Psalter Hymnal 111. message this morning is on John chapter 9, especially focusing on the first seven verses and then the uh, end verses, 35 to, to 41. We just read those verses, so I won't read them again, but it's good to have your Bible open in front of you as the word is proclaimed. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we see in our text that a lot of focus is on seeing. The word see is used in many different ways in the English language. We use the word see to describe what your eyes do, your eyeballs do, as they look around and import the visual data around us. Our brains. We also use the word see to talk about understanding. When someone tells us something complicated and asks if we see what they are trying to say. Similarly, we use the word see to talk about our perspective on something. So we say, well, I see it this way. Helen Keller, was, who was deaf and blind, is credited for saying, pity the person who can see but has no vision, showing that vision can refer also to ideas 
and goals for the future. In our text today, the Lord Jesus also talks about seeing and blindness in different ways as he recognizes the biggest struggle for the sinner in this life is not their physical hardships, but their rebellious spirit. And I preach you the gospel of Jesus Christ under this theme, Christ brings the blind and humble to see and worship him. You see the movement in our text from hurt to healing, from fear to faith, from ignorance to innocence, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ that continues today. The suffering and hurt of the man that Jesus saw sitting, begging, it went far beyond just his blindness. You see, not only was he blind from birth, but as he sat there, he could hear his neighbors discuss whether or not he was the same man who was begging. Imagine being that blind man. Then he learned that he had never been anything more than a faceless part of the scenery. Even when he kept saying that he really was the man who used to be blind, the conversation between the neighbors just continued on as if he didn't exist. Rather than pay any attention to him, they, they took the voiceless, faceless, blind beggar to the Pharisees to make a judgment about who he is and what to do with his claims about the man named Jesus. The church's conclusion that was in line of Job's friends and assumed that blindness had to be a punishment from God further intensified the blind man's suffering as the different scholars debated whether he was like this because of some sin he had committed in the womb, and then they even point to Esau when they were discussing this, or if perhaps his blindness was a punishment for some sin that his parents had committed. And they were thinking maybe of Ezekiel 18, the, the sin of one generation related to the next generation. And so they discussed this man's history. And when we consider that the Pharisees considered a sinner one who did not have God, you can see that, for example, verse 16, it's likely that the man lived his whole life being told and believing that he was a reprobate without any hope in this life or the life to come. You can imagine that the disciples' questions did not help him to feel better as they stood there treating him, talking about him, and so treating him as a faceless, voiceless, hopeless expression of God's wrath and pretending to be judges of what they knew nothing about. The words of Jesus as he answered his disciples would have been like a most marvelous, precious balm of healing for the blind man's soul. Neither he nor his parents had sinned to cause this blindness. Who was this man, Jesus, who took the burden of the guilt of sin off his heart with these promising words? What an amazing word for the blind man to hear. What a, what a wonderful thing. And brothers and sisters, we need to pay close attention to Jesus' declaration. For in the first place, it shows us how wrong it is to think that blindness is a specific punishment, an expression of the wrath of God against a person. When Jesus said to the crowd around him, what Jesus said to the crowd around him is also true for us. You see, although our special needs and our illnesses are clearly a result of the moment when sin 
and decay and death entered the world at the time of the fall, and they are not outside the power of God and the will of God, we cannot consider them all a specific punishment of God against us. It is true that the illnesses and special needs of God's people, of anyone, can be very difficult to bear, can be very difficult to deal with. Yet we must also be careful to see that if God gives our loved ones this different road to travel, the unique challenges and experiences do not need to be viewed as if they are always bad all the time, always needing of special pity, and in fact can also be seen as a unique and a special way to bring glory to God. That's what our Lord Jesus says in our text. We see that in the second place. He says that the man was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. The Lord had a, had a goal. He had a, he had a purpose. It was beyond what the disciples were discussing. The Lord Jesus, in fact, he, he flipped the question around. And instead of allowing the blind man to continue to be nothing more than a forgotten, voiceless, faceless object on the side of the road, the Son of Man raises him up in the eyes of the onlookers to what God had made him for. And the Son of Man declared that the blind man is actually a privileged and a chosen child who would serve as an instrument through whom God would reveal his works. We are humble. Jesus teaches us that whether or not they are a direct consequence of sinful choices in our lives, God will use the unique and special challenges that we face in our bodies, in our minds, so that in everything the works of God might be displayed. Jesus' explanation of the why of trials shows us simply to Quit trying to figure God out. And instead, pay attention to the, the what and how he'll use who we are for his glory. In our text, the Lord Jesus shows the difference. He mentions that between the day and the light of the works of God and the night when no one will be able to to work. That's verse 4. The time when Jesus was on the earth all the way until he returns is not the time of judgment and condemnation. He's saying it isn't too late for repentance right now. Today isn't a day of judgment. Today is a day for action. Today is a day for reaching out and doing the work of God. As we let the light of him who was sent from heaven shine out from us to those around us. Verses 4 and 5. The Lord Jesus makes it very clear the disciples were wrong to imitate the Pharisees. And anyone else who, who tries to determine the final judgment of God concerning each situation. Jesus calls them rather to see people, that it's better to see people as human beings around you. To focus on being caregivers rather than amateur, unqualified judges. In effect, Jesus' answer is that we need to leave the question of judging with God. Recognize that every person is a unique individual with a place in God's plan. And then call everyone to use who they are, their gifts, their unique situations, all for the glory 
of God. And so we hear the Lord Jesus showing us to be a people reaching out, reaching out in a non-judgmental, compassionate way, reflecting the open arms of our Heavenly Father. It is day, not the day of judgment, day when the light is shining. Once again, Jesus confirmed his preaching with an amazing sign or miracle that confirmed that he was healing the blind man's soul. Now when Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva and he smeared it on the man's eyes and, and the word anointed that we, that we read is, is, is a nice way of, of saying that Jesus took the mud and just smeared it on the blind man's eyes. It must have seemed at first perhaps like a childish prank to further humiliate the man whose hopes had been lifted up by the words of Jesus. Perhaps the blind man felt a surge of anger. Perhaps he felt some shame or even doubt as he wondered if Jesus really was in the end just like all the other people who came to help him and while they secretly pitied him and despised him and reviled him. But Jesus' compassionate words, his declaration of hope and his clear command to go wash in the pool of Siloam, it lifted the blind man up from his, his place of begging and carried him on to the miraculous healing that we read about. The waters of the pool of Siloam that were poured out during the Feast of Tabernacles to commemorate the saving water from the rock in the desert, that water washed the mud and the saliva of our Lord Jesus out of his eyes and says, John, the man came back seeing. Instantaneously, the one who was sent to the pool that's named means sent by the Son of Man who was sent from heaven, immediately he could see all the connections in the brain and the memories and the general knowledge of scenery that scientists explain would ordinarily require many, many years, even with, with newly, fully functioning eyes, seem to happen in an instant. He who was so hurt was completely healed. And with this healing of his emotions, with this healing of his eyes, with this, with this clear, clear understanding of, of who God made him to be, God then graciously moved to heal his heart, to bring him from fear to faith. We need to notice that the man, blind man, he did not ask Jesus for this help. But Jesus just came to him and graciously healed him. God reached down and acted in this man's life so that he could display the works of God and so that God could be glorified through the love and the power of his son, Jesus Christ. But when the man came back from washing the mud and saliva off his eyes, well, the man named Jesus was no longer there. The journey would have to continue. The neighbors were surprised, and they questioned if the man who returned from the pool of Siloam really was the same one who had been sitting there. That's verses 8 to 12. And as we see the conversation develop, it would not be surprising to conclude that the reason the Lord Jesus made the mud and told the man to do the work of washing was because it was a Sabbath and this work would bring the man into contact with the Pharisees. Jesus would not just give him a renewed self-esteem and eyes that could see but would also bring him from fear to faith in the Son. And as expected, the Jewish leaders take issue with the making of mud and the healing that took place on the Sabbath. And when they started really questioning who Jesus was and whether someone sent from God would do such a thing on a Sabbath, 
the healed man affirmed that he was certainly a prophet. That's verses 13 to 17. Jesus had been called a prophet before, but when we, we learn from the Pharisees' interview with the man's parents that any acknowledgement of Jesus as Christ, the Messiah, would be punished with excommunication from the synagogue, we can see that this man was being led by God to overcome fear. You need to understand that at that day and that time, the synagogue was the only church in the world. And outside of it, the man would be considered nothing more than a pagan, a condemned, excommunicated sinner. And yet, the more he interacts with the Pharisees' questions, the clearer the truth became to this man. As they force him to take a stand one way or the other by urging him to give glory to God and to see Jesus as a sinner, that's verses 24 to 25, we see his faith strengthen. And then we see this man, he, he simply puts trust in all that God has revealed. He doesn't base his faith on his feelings or his opinions, but he points the Pharisees to the undeniable facts. A little while ago he says, I was blind and I was sitting and I was begging on the ground and without asking Jesus for anything, he came and he made me see. The Holy Spirit then uses the Pharisees' unbelief to press the man to think about the identity of the man who healed him. The attack of the Pharisees will show us who this Jesus really is. This especially came out when they set Jesus up against Moses. They say that in verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses, as for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And this was really the, the final straw. In verses 30 to 33, we read the beautiful confession of faith of the man who had been healed. He taunts the Pharisees because they don't know a man who can heal a person who has been born blind. Could it be that this man for whom Abraham rejoiced would have been opposed by Moses? He says, never since the world has begun has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. And yet you Pharisees, he says, are suggesting that it is against the law of God. And when we read this, we rejoice as we see this suffering son of Israel make the glorious declaration in verse 34 that Jesus is from God. Verse 33 and 34. John 9, verse 35, says that Jesus heard that the Pharisees had damned the healed man because he stood up for Jesus Christ. And in their arrogant pride, they had refused to see the truth of the miracle that he had performed once again, the Lord Jesus takes the initiative. He acts first. And we read that Jesus found the man who had been healed. The man refused to recant his faith before the Pharisees. And Jesus meets him as he leads, as that man leads the blind leaders in the synagogue into the light of day. And he asks him straight out. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? After calling the man to confess his faith before the enemies of Jesus Christ, the Pharisees, the Lord Jesus comes to him and offers him a, a new spiritual home, a new place of worship in him. And then after making sure that it really could be that Jesus, the Jew, standing before him with human saliva and hands that he could use to form mud 
that that man really is the Messiah and the Son of Man who reveals the glory of God on earth. He confesses his faith and he worships Jesus as Lord. But do not miss this, brothers and sisters, because it was not just in the healing of his vision that God revealed his work in the man born blind, but it was also in the working of faith in his heart, a faith that he was willing to stand up for, a faith that he was willing to defy everyone else in order to defend. The healed man confessed that Jesus was his Lord and Master. He confessed his faith in Jesus as his God. The, the Lord carried him from his fear to his faith, and there he bowed the ground before Jesus Christ. It is a highlight in the Gospel of John who included it so that we too can recognize that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. The last verses of our text, the Lord Jesus explains that further. He brings the man from ignorance to innocence. The Lord Jesus explains to the man that he had come into the world for judgment. And with this, he means he has come to make it very clear where everybody stands with respect to the gospel of salvation. Having just healed a person who had been physically blind, he makes it clear that a much more serious problem is a spiritual blindness, which is an unwillingness to see, to recognize Jesus Christ as Savior. Spiritual blindness is revealed. When the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, shines in the darkness through his preaching and his miracles, and that light forces people to either respond in faith or in disbelief. In this context, the Lord Jesus shows in verse 39 the two reactions that come with the revelation of the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. He says that, First, that he came into this world so that those who do not see may see. And here he is thinking of the man who was born blind, but also did not even know who was claiming to be the Son of Man or where he could find him. The Lord Jesus is talking about people who have never heard of the Bible, who have never heard the gospel as well as those who, who have the, the gospel in their hands, but they do not understand what it says about Jesus. To think of some Jews, or that Ethiopian, or many people who are confused by false teachers still today. The gospel message is that anyone who has been sinning in ignorance, in weakness, due to physical situations that have made it impossible for them to see and to know Jesus Christ. They can know that Jesus calls them to repentance and that there is life in his name, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. In the second place, Jesus says that he came into this world so that those who see may become blind. The following verses confirm that Jesus is talking here about the Pharisees and about people like them who think that they know better than Jesus Christ. Although they only think that they see and perhaps should be able to see for having the word of God, the fact is the preaching of the gospel, the signs, the miracles, the light of truth only serves to show that they are closing their eyes in rebellion to God's revelation. 
like the Pharisees who refused to submit themselves to Jesus as Lord. The paradox of Revelation is that when the light shines, it exposes the truth. And then what happens? The blind man is able to see. The blind man is shown to be the one who can see spiritually, and the ones whose eyes are physically seeing are shown by the light to actually have their eyes closed. When Jesus passed by a man born blind, he did not see a worthless, faceless, voiceless expression of God's wrath. But he saw an instrument to whom God would reveal his works. The disciples were wrong to make themselves judges of another man's soul and ask the questions that they did when they should have been showing grace and compassion. The Pharisees were wrong to sit there condemning Jesus without rejoicing in the healing of the man and his new life. Jesus includes us when he said that we must work the works that God sent Jesus to do while there is still time, while it is still day. This compassion went beyond just physical health. When Jesus looked at the man born blind, he saw a man who couldn't see Jesus as a Savior standing in front of him. He didn't know about God's saving work in Jesus Christ. Jesus saw a man who was affected by the fall and the sin into sin and the weakness of the flesh so that he was born blind. And Jesus made it clear that this weakness was not a punishment of God. You see, brothers and sisters, God does not punish anyone for being weak. He does not punish anyone for sins done in the past that you hate, that you don't want to repeat. He doesn't punish for those sins that are done in weakness. He doesn't punish you for those sins, but he punishes you for rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior when he shows himself, when he calls to you to come to him, to his open arms. The only thing that hinders this relationship to our loving God, the only thing are the decisions that you make today when Jesus calls you. Today, it is still day. When God shows you his light, and you hear his, his call and, and his love, and you, you read about his power and and you humble himself before his holiness together in, in, his, in, in the congregation, how do you react? And God allows you to see his glory. And he does. What do you do? close your eyes in ignorance again like the Pharisees because they did not want to know that they were wrong because you prefer to do things your own way or do you repent do you humble yourself before your loving Savior the gospel is that he sent his son into the world to bear the burden of God's wrath so that you do not have to. Because of the work of Jesus Christ who pays for the sins of everyone who repents and believes in him, we, we can declare with joy the words of our Lord in Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 3, Matthew 12, verse 20, so clearly shown in our text. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Great encouragement for every one of us in our spirit.
struggle against our own sins. In Christ, we can move. There can be movement from ignorance to innocence. And our ignorance of, of who Jesus is, the love of God, our ignorance, whatever causes a person not to see, whether they be physical needs or special mental disorders, or in a totally dis different sphere, a, a past life of confusion and bad choices, to a family situation that messed up your priorities, you can know that your past situations do not need to hinder your relationship with Christ today. Praise our King, Jesus Christ, who came from the glory of heaven to this earth to tell us this good news, to call us to him in his way as he brings the blind and the humble to see and to worship him as eternal Savior. May you walk humbly in his gracious work today and evermore. Amen. Bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we are humbled by your great love toward us. We are reminded that if faith and trust in you are virtues in the kingdom, if dependence is the sign of the work of the Spirit, then our weakness, the sign of strength in this place, in your kingdom. Father, as we hear again the good news of your love, your grace to us in Jesus Christ, we pray that you will work powerfully in our hearts by your Holy Spirit to run to Jesus Christ. Find in him all that we need for this life and for the life to come. We pray that you will help each one of us in our unique situations. Each one of us with our own unique, special needs. Each one of us, the unique journey that you have set us on. Whatever our age may be whatever our experiences in this life, whatever our week looks like, help us, Lord, to use our heads and our hearts and our hands to glorify, to praise you. Help us to rest completely in Jesus Christ, to embrace him, and to rejoice the good news, the forgiveness of all our sins, the new life in your spirit. We ask, O oh Lord, all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who died on a cross to give us access to your throne of grace. Amen.